Okay, good. Well, thanks very much for coming. Uh, I know it's a very busy time, and um, probably there are a lot. Of, the problem in London is always uh, about five or six competing linguistic events at the same time. So, um, teacher students forum. Sorry. We also just had the teachers. Yeah, it is. Yes, yes. So uh, that that's happened as well. So. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, you've seen the abstract, I'm going to give um, Andy, Andy uh, Kirkpatrick, who is a professor of linguistics at Griffith University, but he's actually also an honorary professorial fellow here at SOAS. Um, I'm going to give him as much time as possible, <laughs> well, and therefore I'm going to <coughs> say, uh, usually I say, um, he doesn't need, the person doesn't need an introduction, but he deserves one. Now, you certainly deserve one, but because people have an abstract, I'm going to give you more time rather okay. than read your um, work. What I should point out is that really um, Andy is one of the top scholars on language policy and especially Asian Englishes, and um, we're very, very pleased that he's um, chosen to be an honorary fellow with us and that he contributes to especially courses like language policy, but also English in the global world. Over to you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Hey, please. Well, that's the title. And although it's just me standing here, I have to acknowledge the work of Tony Lidicott in this presentation, because we have just... The proofs are currently with the publishers and I'm just re doing reading some of them. This book here called the Routledge International Handbook of Language Policy, Education Policy in Asia. It's coming out, we hope, in a few months. And Tony and I have been editing it. So a lot of the what I'm going to say now, uh, I really have to acknowledge Tony's contribution to this. Uh, and I think Anne knows Tony very well from many, many years back, from another Australian. Okay. First of all, Asia. It's one of those things you don't want people to ask you these questions about could you define Asia? And I'm sure SOA spends a lot, a lot of time <laughs> talking about this particular topic. I'm, we decided just so, and so we've decided, so that's it. Uh, we, we decided it was going to be East and Southeast, South and Central Asia, but not Asian Russia or West Asia and the Middle East. So. But basically, we are talking about the stands, though. Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan come into this. Uh, but not the Middle East itself. So we're basically India, all that part of the world, yes. And of course, East Asia and Southeast Asia. And, you know, Asia, it's interesting to me that, I don't know whether you have it here at SOAS, but when people refer to Asia, they tend not to refer to Asia, they tend to refer to individual countries. But when people refer to Africa, they still tend to refer to as Africa, as though it was some kind of unified block, despite being 55, whatever it is, countries of completely different types. And, and so so that sort of strikes me as very unusual. The other difference, I think, between Asia and Africa in this context is that Africa very often has adapted colonial languages as their languages and there's been huge debate about this for many, many years. But by and large in Asia, the opposite was the case. They have identified a national language, which they then promoted to become the language of that particular country. So that's quite a significant difference, really. And when we look, talk about language policy and education here, we're going to talk about four different types, four different sort of frameworks. One is national languages. How did they come about and what are they? One is English. What role is English playing in the language education policies of these countries? What about the indigenous languages? Uh, Asia, or the, uh, how we've defined it anyway, is the most linguistically diverse place on the planet. Uh, India with 800 something languages, Indonesia with 700 or so languages. These are, these are really, really diverse linguistically. What's happening to those languages? And what's happening to other foreign languages, like the old post-colonial languages, like French or whatever, are they still being taught or not? So that's the kind of area that we're, we're looking at. And there's a small group 
So if you have any questions, of course, you can just ask at any time, because there's not very many of us, so we can talk at them. Uh, as you'll know, that most countries were colonized in, in uh, the area we're talking about. Some were not. I mean, Thailand wasn't, Nepal wasn't. But by and large, most of the countries we're talking about were colonies. Japan itself operated as a colonial power for some time over Taiwan, for example, uh, parts of China. Uh, China was never colonized, although had chunks of its land owned, if you like, by various European powers in Japan. But basically, they are, old, they are new countries who have received independence since the Second World War of one sort or another. I grew up in what was called Malaya, it was now Malaysia, and I was there when they celebrated independence in 1957, Merdeka as they call it, and I stood loyally with a Union Jack, because I was English in those days, stood by the side of the road and hold my Union Jack and waved it as the Duke of Edinburgh went past in the car to hand over, as it were, the country to the, Malay the Malaysian population. <coughs> so this kind of activity was going on quite often over the world. And the kind of uh, regimes that replace the colonial powers are interesting and complex in many ways. So, as I said before, at independence, much of Asia rejected the use of colonial languages and chose local languages. And I'll just talk very briefly here about Indonesia because it's a fascinating example. Indonesia, as I mentioned earlier, has something like 700 languages spoken in it. And when the, the, sort of the, 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 the youth and the rebellion movement were coming up against the Dutch and so forth, coming up during the Second World War and before, they were looking for a language that they could use to express the independence of Indonesia. And they chose eventually Bahasa Malaysia, which was a language not spoken by many Indonesians at all. In fact, Bahasa Malaysia was spoken by only 3% of the population as a first language when it was adopted as the language of liberation, the language of revolution, and then became constitutionally enshrined as the national language after the Second World War. Now, something like 70% uh, of the population of Indonesia will claim to have a pretty good knowledge of Indonesian. Bahasa Indonesia, they call it Bahasa Indonesia, which is an Indonesian language. It's basically Malay with differences. I mean, there's a different sort of vocabulary set and so forth, but basically it's the same language. So here you have a, a, a newly independent nation choosing a language spoken by only 3% of the population to be the national language, which is very interesting and a very interesting insight, actually, into the often misunderstood but highly multicultural, tolerant view, uh, uh, Indonesian view of life compared with some other, other places. And I think uh, it's very interesting. China, on the other hand, of course, had a top-down policy. Everyone will speak Purunghua Mandarin, and that's it and that's the language of the capital, and you're going to speak this way. The same thing happened in the Philippines, as we'll see. Okay. Sometimes there are multiple local languages. Singapore, we'll talk about these in more detail later. Uh, Russian in Kazakhstan and so forth, but the role of Russian in the stands is gradually declining and being replaced very often by English in many of these, many of these contexts. Not all of them, but uh, in some of them. Portuguese in Timor-Leste, that's an interesting one. I mean, it's, very, it's spoken by very, very few people, but it's still being held up as an, an official language there, and there's all sorts of feeling among the youth of Timor-Leste, East Timor, that English would be a much better language to be investing in than Portuguese. But uh, the, the, the money coming for this, it comes from Brazil. Uh, and in, same with Macau, that's where the rich, the, the sort of promotion of Portuguese is not from Portugal anymore, they've got no money at all. <laughs> it's coming from Brazil. So Brazil is the, is the player in this part of the world in terms of main, the maintenance of Portuguese, quite interesting I think. And we'll talk about Hong Kong later, it's one of the places I, I know quite well. Okay, so far okay with it? Good. 
Now, and these are very often newly independent countries. And if you have a newly independent country, what the government always wants is we have to have a national language. Because we need a language that will, they will say, glue us together, bind us, be our identity. We are Albanians because we speak Albanian, for example. Okay, so you have a, a sort of planning, a kind of corpus planning here of promotion of a particular language. And therefore, you need to start to standardize it and start to do all those kind of uh, the hard work of making sure everyone's learning the same language. Uh, despite the kind of possible variations that may be in it. And we'll see lots of interesting things about that. One of the, I mean, the, the Chinese Communist Party, one of its greatest achievements probably, apart from the raising the status of women through the, the marriage law uh, in the 1950s, is the development of literacy across China. I've studied in China in the 1970s for a couple of years when uh, Mao was still knocking around uh, some time ago. And we had to go and go on to study the workers, because that's what we had to do. We had to go and Shui Nong, had to Shui Gong and Shui Nong, had to go and study the workers and the peasantry. And I was in a political study group, because all these working, uh, these factories had political study groups that met twice a week. <coughs> and you were given a text by Mao, and you studied it. And there were about eight people in my study group, and I was in a machine tool lathe. I was master worker cur, machine tool lathe operator, uh, which I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and anyway, sat around in this study circle, and the, the, the sort of political con the guy would say, right, who would like to start? And we were reading Mao's Ten Great Relationships on Shudao Ganchi, the famous Ten Great Relationships of Mao. And I was the only person in the group, I was the only non-Chinese in the group, who could read it. No one else could read Chinese. So that was very embarrassing for me, because how would you think you'd feel being the only person who could read the text? But it also showed that very, very few Chinese were literate, uh, that even in that time, in the 1970s. You compare that now, it's a fantastic achievement, the illiteracy rates that they've achieved. Been brilliant. Okay, so literacy development has been very, very important and crucially important, of course, for education because you need the written word for education, basically. So, that's what's been going on. Now, Singapore, let's have a look at some examples. Singapore has four national languages. Malay is, sorry, four official languages and one national language. Malay is the national language of Singapore, which is odd because only about 8-10% of the people speak it or have any knowledge of it, uh, English, Tamil and Mandarin Chinese. Now, Tamil is interesting because it's the language of the original migrants from India and Tamil is usually associated, ha has a negative uh, association in places like Singapore because the Tamils tended to be the labourers. So they, they worked in rubber plantations or tin mines or whatever. So they were seen to be sort of the lower class. And Tamil then got this association with the lower classes. Yet in Singapore now, most of the Indians there are in high-tech IT. And they, they speak other languages, Hindi obviously, and others. So for Tamil to remain the official language is odd in the context of Singapore. However, I have a PhD student who just finished a PhD on Tamil maintenance in Singapore and is actually doing quite well, much to everyone's surprise, so, which is, I think, quite encouraging. But Indians are allowed to learn other Indian languages as long as they pay for it themselves, community schools. This is not the case with Chinese. If you are Chinese, the government tells you your mother tongue is Putonghua Mandarin. Doesn't matter if your mother speak Cantonese or Shanghainese or any of the other languages. As far as the government goes, if you're Chinese, you are mother tongue is Mandarin and you will learn Mandarin. And that's caused a huge, huge problem because it's not the case. And they've, uh, as we'll see a bit later, many, many Singaporean Chinese are, f are very fluent in speaking Putonghua, but they're not very strong in literacy in Chinese. And one of the problems about Chinese literacy has been that they kind of taught Chinese to these 
Singaporean Chinese as though they were mainland Chinese, as though they had China, Mandarin all around them, but they didn't. So there's been a, a problem with the literacy elements. And Malay, very few people have. The point is that English in Singapore schools is the medium of instruction. The other languages are taught only as subjects. So despite having all these four languages, actually the language in Singapore these days is English. And if you, be, if you go, be, go there now, you'll find pretty well everybody speaks pretty good English, different varieties of it. We'll talk about Hong Kong later. Anybody got any questions about any of these places? Because we'll talk about them a bit more later. Well, it should, yeah. Okay. Now, most of the countries, what's happening is most of these countries are in their language education policy are promoting or privileging the national language as the language of education. So if you live in Indonesia, you go to school, you'll be taught through Bahasa Indonesia. If you're in Vietnam, it'll be Vietnamese, right? All these, that'll be the national language will be taught in the school. The second language in almost all these countries is not now another Asian language or indigenous language, but English. So, and this is being introduced earlier and earlier into the curriculum. Places like uh, in China, it's year th primary three, although in many places it's earlier than that. But in Cambodia, even it's primary four, uh, despite the fact there's no one to teach it and no one learns it in primary four because there aren't any teachers. The official policy says English will be introduced in primary four in Cambodian schools, but outside Phnom Penh it's not because there's no one to teach it. Uh, in Vietnam, they're just introducing it at primary three in the last couple of years. So English is being introduced into the school curricula in all these countries as compulsory language after the national language, with the sole exception of Indonesia. Indonesia is the only country of this, most of this part of the world, uh, most of Asia, that doesn't have in English as a compulsory subject in the primary curriculum. Having said that, if you want to set up a primary school in Indonesia and you don't have English, the parents may not send their kids to it because they'll think English is hugely important for little Jimmy or little Julie to become hugely international successful entrepreneurs or global players. What the Japanese call human global resources, uh, which they're trying also to introduce. And you want to say to people who say, if you learn English, you'll become a human global resource, Think of all the people you know who speak English and wonder whether they are indeed a human global resource. You begin to think perhaps the, uh, the logic isn't perfect there. Okay, any questions so far? How are we doing? All right. All right. All right. Okay, everybody thinks that if they learn English, well, the governments think the more English that our people have, the more successful our country will be in the international development, globalization, modernization, ideological thing. Uh, and it's often implemented without really much thought or preparation. So we mentioned before in Cambodia, it's now primary four compulsory, but there are no teachers to teach it. In Burma, it's introduced from primary one, Myanmar, Burma, uh, from primary one, it's also the promoted language of higher education in Burma, in Myanmar, in all higher education institutions. This despite the fact that very few people in those higher education institutions speak English. The official policy nevertheless is, and myself and Jolo Bianco, well Jolo Bianco was the overseer of the project, uh, funded by the sort of uh, UNESCO to develop a language policy for Cambodia, and I was involved in developing the school language policy which we presented in Mandalay in February 2016. And we argued very strongly for the introduction of languages like Mon and Kachin and Karen in the primary school and so forth to let mother tongue education develop that. And the then director of education thought it was a jolly good idea and he kind of said, yes, thank you very much. And then Aung San Suu Kyi, the following week basically, decided that she would take on the portfolio of the education ministry and decided, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go back to what we had before. It's going to be only two languages, Burmese and English. So, so that's, they've gone back to Burmese and English. 
and all sorts of problems associated with that, not least for trying to unify Burma with all the different ethnic groups within Burma and the different languages. Um, now, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, these are the ten nations starting at the sort of Philippines in the Far East, going all the way down to Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, all that lot. Thailand, I said to Malaysia, Brunei, those ten countries. That association has made English the sole working language of the group. This is really interesting. I mean, you can imagine what would have happened if the European Union had said English will be the sole working language of the group. Uh, the Brexit might have happened a bit earlier. <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, ASEAN has agreed to have this. Uh, I was talking to the Director General in, of ASEAN, a, 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 a Filipino guy, about 10 years ago in Bangkok. And he said, you know, I said, what, what about other languages? Why not Malay, for example? Because the initial group of ASEAN was the Philippines, Brunei, Singapore, Malaysia. And Thailand and Malay has a very strong hold in all those five countries. So why Malay was an obvious language for the he said, no, 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 no. Pandora's box, we're not going to open that one. No one they we give them Malay, they'll all want something. And, <laughs> and that was the view. And when Vietnam joined, uh, they asked for another language to be, you know, this was before English was made the official soul work, it was just the de facto lang working language. And guess what the language the Vietnamese wanted? They wanted French, yeah. And the, the other said, ah, no, you're not having French, you can shove off. So it just remained English. And then two years ago, or three years ago, it was officially legislated in Article 34 of the ASEAN Charter that English will be the sole working language of ASEAN. It is also being co-opted to develop uh, socio-cultural ties, political ties, and security. English is being held up as the language in which to do all these things in ASEAN. And we can talk about the possible contradictions in that of how one can respect unity and diversity as one of the standard slogans by using English uh, in order to do it. Okay, but this is another motivation then for the school's curricula to have English because ASEAN is now the sole working language. I've also sat in, very interesting this, I mean, I'm a bit of a tangent, but I've sat in on centre director meetings in ASEAN from time to time, recording them with permission for various things. And you find that the Laotians tend to be silent because they don't have very much English. And if they do have a Laotian there, he or she will be there because he or she knows English, not the, not the subject matter that they're dealing with. So pelagic fishing, for example, deep sea fishing, there'll be a meeting about that. The Laotian candidate may have very good knowledge about different types of be able to speak about fish in English, but won't know anything about fishing. <laughs> so can't really make much of a contribution. So there is, a, there is some way to go before ASEAN comes. But the deputy, the, sorry, the director general himself a couple of years ago said, apart from high level prime ministerial meetings, everything is in English below that. So only the prime ministers are allowed translators. No one else is. And uh, the director general, again, 10 years ago, he said, do you know why we do this? You asked me this question. I said, oh, what's the question? He said, how much does the European Union pay on translation and interpreting? I said, I don't know. He said, two billion US dollars. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it sounds like. And he then said, now, how much do we pay? ASEAN, how much do we pay? I said, I don't know. He said, none, nothing. If you want it translated, you do it yourself. So, so it was a pretty strong financial argument. <laughs> uh, Okay, what about, what's happening to the indigenous languages then? Are they being taught in the school system? Well, to summarize very quickly, no, they're not. What's happening is that uh, the governments are promoting the national languages, the respective national languages, whether that's Vietnamese or Khmer or whatever it might be, plus English. And these are dominating the school system, these two languages. And as I said earlier, English is being introduced earlier and earlier into the curriculum. Now, there are some examples of where this is not happening, but uh, basically it is. And in almost all cases, 
uh, the adoption of languages of education is dependent upon NGOs or religious institutions. I've got, I thought I'd give you some, if I can find it. Yes, in, uh, excuse me, I just, yeah. Bangladesh is interesting because there's a very significant tension in Bangladesh between private and public education and both at the school level and at the university level. And basically all private education is the English medium. And the government has introduced a rule, rule a couple of years ago saying if you're a private institution you've got to have Bangla taught at least as a subject, the language taught at least as a subject in the schools. The private institutions though are basically English medium and they're more prestigious. So mum and dad want their kids to go to private universities by and large and of course that means mum and dad want their kids to learn English so they can get to private universities. So this is a really, and the government is not putting in much support because it doesn't have very much money on to promote Bangla in the schools. This is hugely ironic because Bangladesh itself owes its existence, if you like, to language. I mean it's because they spoke a different language from the other people in Pakistan, in East Pakistan, West Pakistan, that they split away and became their own country. And the name of the country is, you know, is, has its language there. It's Bangladesh, the language of the, the country of Bangla. But it's under some sort of threat from English and certainly in the higher institutions. And indigenous languages, this, this is what I wanted to read out to you because it, it struck me as quite extraordinary when I read it. Uh, Bangladesh provides an example of a place where the teaching of indigenous languages is dependent upon NGOs and external funding. The NGO Building Resources Across Communities, BRAC, is the largest NGO in the world and in Bangladesh BRAC owns 13,800 pre-primary schools. 13,800 pre-primary schools with 400,000 students and 22 22,971 primary schools with nearly 700,000 students. So this is an NGO uh, really taking care of a lot of education. In ba Don't forget that Bangladesh is a very populated country, of course, so this seems like lots and lots of people to us, but it's not that many. But then they also operate 16, 1,600 ethnic minority schools in the southeastern region of Bangladesh, which is where most of the minority languages are spoken. So there is some NGO work going on, something quite significant, in the promotion and maintenance of indigenous languages, but it's not really throughout this part of the world, it's not coming from the government, it's coming from NGOs and religious institutions in some cases. Uh, obviously in terms of uh, Islam, a lot of the, the madrasas teach Arabic, classical Arabic, and, and so there, is, there, is, there are other languages taught, but it tends to be either religious institutions or NGOs, not governments. Example, a, a, a very good counterexample of this is the Philippines. Now, the Philippines in 1974 introduced the bilingual education policy, whereby every kid who went to school from primary one learned maths and science through English, and all other subjects through Filipino. Now, that has been a pretty disastrous policy because the Philippines is also highly linguistically diverse with something like 170 languages spoken. And Filipino is a little bit of leisure de main. <laughs> Filipino is not really Filipino at all. Filipino is Tagalog, which is the language spoken by, around Manila by about five million people that the Language Commission of the Philippines was told to take Tagalog and, and fiddle around with it and then sell it back to the people as Filipino. Well, they, <laughs> they made a mistake at the beginning because they sold it back to the Filipinos as Pilipino. Well, that gave was a bit of a giveaway because only Tagalog speakers can't say fuzz. So if you call it Pilipino, then the only people who can say Pilipino are the Tagalogs. So he said, well, we have to, oh, it's not very clever. So they went back and said, I, we've got a good idea, we'll call it Filipino now. So the Tagalog speakers still call it Pilipino, but they're the only ones. So uh, the Cebuanos and Elocanos, all that, can speak Filipino. So it's now become 
more accepted as a national language, to be fair. But in 1974, you would get kids going to primary school, primary one, and l being taught in l languages that they didn't know at all. Very few would know any English, and they'd have to do maths and science with that, and very few would necessarily know Filipino, Filipino, Tagalog. So you can imagine the, the kind of debates that have been going around for 30 years, more than 30 years. In 2013, the then Aquino, President Aquino, announced that there will be, from next semester, mother tongue based multilingual education, MTB MLE. Now, 12 languages were initially gazetted as being to, to be used. And they were to be used for the first three years of primary school as medium of instruction, and then Filipino and English taught as subjects, and then the Filipino English would slowly take over as medium of instruction. There was a bit of an outcry because they saw when well, there are 170 languages in the Philippines, you only got 12, what about the others? So after some humming and hawing, they came up with 19. So there are now 19 gazetted languages uh, to be taught in the first three years. It's not going really well uh, because, I mean, from someone like me who, you know, have a sort of kind of like, liking languages, you, you want to see them maintained. I mean, you like to have languages. But if people don't want them, there's not much anyone can do about it. And most of the parents still are not convinced that if their children are taught through a language that they know, the home language, it will necessarily be very good for them in the longer term. They would much rather, by and large, have their kids taught through the national language and later English because they believe that this will actually be beneficial for their children. And it's very difficult to persuade parents that if you actually let the kids learn in their first language first, they will actually do much better in everything later on. They will learn Filipino better, they will learn English better, and blah, blah, blah. It's a very difficult sell. And no politician that I know of has been able to sell it, except for here, the Philippines. They've actually been very brave. The other place that's been pretty brave about it is Malaysia. Because Malaysia had a policy of teaching maths and science through English uh, from primary one. In 2002, they introduced that. And then after nine years of it, they, re they, they chucked it out because they found that kids from the poor parts, the rural areas and so forth, were simply not coping. And they did not have teachers who had enough English to teach maths and science through English anyway. Although they could teach it perfectly well in Malay. Right? So uh, you've got the situation where kids in some sort of up in urban schools were mocking teachers because their English, in, when they were teaching maths and science, were very good. And on the other hand, you've got kids whose English wasn't very good failing in maths and science. So they changed it. So now it went back to Malay, and now it's gone back again to a dual language policy where the schools can choose whether to teach in Malay or English in primary school, maths and science. So it's complicated. Lots and lots of twists and turns. Okay? All right. There is a multi -education, multilingual education national plan in Cambodia. Cambodia is a country which is linguistically pretty, well, it may seem quite diverse to us because there are 25 or 26 languages spoken, but in terms of Asia, it's not. It's one of the most uh, homogeneous societies. 90% of the Cambodians speak Khmer. As a, so the national language was an easy pick. Everybody speaks Khmer. Uh, up in the north, West of Cambodia is where many of the minority languages are spoken. And because there was a minister of education who was really interested in minority languages, it got funding. So, but it, we don't know how much longer that funding is going to go on for because the ministers, as you all know, <laughs> change. <laughs> as, even if the prime minister of Cambodia doesn't, the ministers do. <laughs> yes, Hun Sen has been there for a while. I, very little chance of it moving on, I don't think, at the moment. So, so basically, though, the other thing, of course, and this is very important, some governments feel that people who don't learn the national language or learn languages other than the national language are potentially dangerous splitists. 
they will break away. This has been much the fear of China in some places. It's also in Thailand an issue. Uh, in the south of, south of Thailand, Patani Malay is the mother tongue of many of the people, yet Thai remains the medium of instruction for all those schools in the south and has caused a lot of uh, ethnic uh, unrest, as you're probably aware that there's a lot of uh, unrest in southern Thailand. Uh, it's not just, it's a religious thing, uh, but it's also a linguistic thing uh, because of Malay. But Thailand has Thai as the proscribed language of education. How are we doing for time? Now this is crucially important. The UNESCO figures are pretty shocking about this. The number of children who drop out in many of these school systems around about primary five is really very high. Uh, I can't give you the exact figures now, but they, they are shocking. And a lot of the, the kids dropping out of primary five are dropping out usually because of linguistic reasons. Because they're not being, they were never taught in their, first, their mother tongue, so they get behind in school and then they never progress and they finally drop out. So this is a really huge issue and why I think UNESCO and others have been so adamant that mother tongue education is crucial for children, uh, especially in the early years of primary school. And if you don't give them education in their L1s, then they may well drop out of school. So it's a huge, huge issue. And coupled with that, of course, the fact that language is, is language is removed from the school curriculum means it's very likely to become endangered. As Heil Coleman said years ago, the best way of you know, killing a language is to remove it from the education system. Because as soon as you take it out of the school system, mum and dad will say, don't bother with that language, it's not important. You must speak the languages that they speak in school. So we get this. Foreign languages, well, not many. I mean, the language that is being learned most probably is Chinese. Uh, uh, English is the second language learned by a huge margin. A lot of the other languages, when, if these are languages from outside, so sort of not Asian language, language from outside, tend to be taught from of starting at university level, so it tend to be tertiary education. There are very, well, I, I don't think there's a single ASEAN country that has in its primary and secondary school syllabus another ASEAN language other than its own national language. So if you're in Vietnam, you will not learn Thai or Lao or Khmer or you just won't learn these languages. Okay, you will learn English. And ASEAN has said that's good because we're going to use English to become ASEAN. And ASEAN English will do it. Uh, in places where French was the colonial language, like Cambodia, Vietnam, it has lost a huge amount of ground to, to English. And French NGOs in Cambodia now advertise for people who speak English, not French. So, so even French NGOs operating in Cambodia are requiring their staff to learn English as well as Khmer. In Islamic countries, Arabic has maintained a position in schools, especially in religious schools. But interestingly, in places like Indonesia, the madrasas or the pasantran, these are the, the, the schools attached to mosques, not all of them, but a significant number of them now teach English for Islamic purposes. Course is called English for Islamic purposes. And uh, you would think, you know, that if the last thing that you would expect percent mosque schools to be teaching their kids would be English, because, you know, English is all that dangerous stuff, you don't want to ruin you know, horrible people with short skirts and eating all sorts of horrible food, you know, all that. But no, they have English for Islamic purposes. And uh, 
very, one curriculum is making plans. If you're making plans in the English lesson, you have to say when you're speaking English, tomorrow I will see my mother, you have to have inshallah as the part of the text. I mean, it's, you have to use it, you can't not. So, so Islamic purposes. Now, Russian has basically disappeared. I mean, uh, I mean, Russian, of course, was the first foreign language learned in China from until they split in the 1950s. And a great friend of mine, Professor Li, who's now oh, 80, 80 odd, was trained first as a Russian teacher in Beijing University, and then, as was the case, you know, almost overnight, said, "Okay." Tomorrow you are an English teacher. <laughs> they said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I've got to struggle now. The, the, the best I ever saw though for cross-training from teachers who suddenly become un, you know, unviable in the new system. When I was working in Singapore and the government decided, as these governments tend to do, right, we're going to have, get rid of all the Chinese medium, we're going to close down the Chinese medium university, get rid of the Chinese medium schools, they're too troublesome, these Chinese, they're talking about rebellion and revolution all the time, going to get rid of them, and we're going to just go to English. Well, I was working at the Institute of Education, that is teacher training, and uh, we had uh, a bunch of people who had been teaching Chinese, these were Chinese teachers, and they were, no, this is Singapore, Singapore, this is Singapore, and uh, they were sort of scholarly Confucian types, you know, who would sort of whack you on the knuckles, you've got a tone wrong, that kind of stuff. And we, were, we had to retrain them. Well, they came, I said, what are we, what are we gonna, anyway, some genius came up with the idea of retraining them as PE teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have the image of these Confucian gentlemen <laughs> playing basketball. It's funny, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's a nice story. Anyway, there you go. So, basically, the foreign languages are not really being taught in schools. No, certainly not in schools. In universities, yes, but not so much in schools. What I haven't spoken too much about, and we can talk about it, is the increasing use of English in higher education in the universities in this region, which is causing also a tremendous amount of confusion and controversy. Uh, but there are, there's, there's some evidence the decline may be holding. In other words, there is some uh, feeling that maybe we've gone too far with English, perhaps we should rethink this. But I don't think it's really very serious yet, certainly not in the school systems, uh, and certainly not with the local languages either. I want to talk a little bit now about uh, Hong Kong because I spent quite a long time there and how the system there works because Hong Kong, as you know, is not a country, it's a special administrative region of China now, but has its own education policy, it doesn't follow the Chinese one. The Chinese national language law proscribes all, language, all Chinese languages other than Pudonghua from education. Languages of China, in other words, the languages of minority groups, can be taught. So if you're a Zhuang or Miao, you can learn Zhuang or Miao in school. Whether you do or not is a different matter, but that, that's, it's allowed. But you do not learn Cantonese or Shanghainese or any of the other languages of Chinese languages other than Putonghua. Hong Kong still retains Cantonese as the medium of instruction in primary schools, as does Macau. They're the only two places left where, where Cantonese is used as a medium of instruction. Now, the Hong Kong government's policy is laudable. It's, it wants its people to be trilingual in Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. And for those of you who are not familiar with Chinese languages, Cantonese and Mandarin are mutually unintelligible languages. They're different. I mean, you can't, just knowing one doesn't help you know the other. I mean, it's... it's I mean, I know Mandarin, and I've lived in Hong Kong for 
eight years and my Cantonese is lousy, despite the attempts to make it. <laughs> so so it's, it's tough. But there are eight government funded universities in Hong Kong, six of which have e are EMI only. So the Chinese University of Hong Kong was set up in 1963 specifically to be a Chinese medium university for the Chinese speaking community, which of course is 95% of the population. <laughs> uh, but even when it was set up to get into the Chinese university in 1963, you had to do well in your English exams at school to get into it. So we kind of missed the point, but there you go. Uh, now, because the, the, the vice chancellor of the Chinese University of Hong Kong is very keen to his university to go up the rankings, the international rankings, in the last five or six years, has been allowing more and more English medium programs to be taught in the view that this will increase the internationalization of the university and therefore up the rankings. The students took the university to court saying that it was uh, breaking its, uh, its own charter by allowing English to be used as a medium of instruction. And Chinese was, should be the sole medium of instruction. The students lost in the Supreme Court. They lost that fight. And the Supreme Court ruled that the university could choose whichever medium of instruction it wanted. So the students lost that fight. So even the Chinese University of Hong Kong is moving, is, is increasing its number of EMI programs. The only university, now university in Hong Kong, is the Hong Kong Education University, it used to be the Institute of Education Hong Kong, which is where I used to work. Yes. And we are the only one that is, who has as its aim to produce functionally trilingual <coughs> biliterate graduates. So if you come to the University of Education Hong Kong, you will learn Cantonese, you will learn Putuhua, you will learn English. Jolly good. And uh, yeah, so. I was just very proud about that. You also, the only place in Hong Kong I think you can learn Cantonese as an academic language. Chinese, even. Because most, even Cantonese speakers will say, Cantonese oh, is just a vernacular language, there's no written form done. Which is nonsense. There's a written form of Cantonese and it's used in all sorts of professional circumstances, like the law, teaching. I mean, it's, it's a huge, very important. But because these universities are English medium, Therefore, the parents want their children to learn through English because they want their children to go to English medium schools. Now, in 1997, at the time of the handover, as it's so-called, the government said, right, we're going to change the policy now. In the past, secondary schools had the freedom to choose which medium of instruction they chose. And almost all of them chose English. And when I was working in Singapore in the 1970s, late 70s, I would go into a history class and watch some person teaching history and it was supposed to be an English medium class and the kids were all there and the teacher was there and the textbook was English and the teacher would stand up and he would translate the textbook into Cantonese and, he'd translate it, and the kids would write in the margins what the English, what, you know, basically. And this was called by Luke and Richards in a famous article in 1982 called the textual translation method of language teaching. <laughs> uh, and that's what it was like. So the government said in 1997, right, unless your schools, secondary schools, meet certain criteria like teachers who can teach it, students who can use it, blah, 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 you're going to be Chinese medium at secondary level. And something like 75% of the secondary schools were then classified as Chinese medium, CMI schools, and only about 25% were classified as English medium schools. Well, that sounds great, except for the fact, of course, immediately the EMI schools become more prestigious and sought after because the parents think their kids are going to get an easier run into the university. So for the next 10 years or so, there's parents constantly saying, we want more English in the secondary school system. And eventually, about five, six years ago, maybe a bit longer, the government gave in and said, OK, we will fine-tune, they call this term, fine-tuning the system, which allowed CMI schools to teach classes in English if they met certain criteria. So what that has meant is that in the last five or six years, 
Chinese medium schools are teaching more and more classes in English, especially science classes, and fewer and fewer classes in Chinese. Again, because of the kids want to go. Now, we know that if you've got a very, very bright Hong Kong Chinese kid in a CMI school, give him an exam in physics or whatever it was, and he can answer in Ch he, she can answer in Chinese, he or she will do better than if you ask that person to do the exam in English. Yet, a lot of these schools are moving to English. So it's a, I think it's a really serious issue. And my own view is that the universities in Hong Kong, and I cannot understand why they don't do it, should be officially bilingual. I mean, why not? I mean, uh, that everyone who goes to a Hong Kong un university in Hong Kong should f feel that they can come out bilingual and biliterate in Chinese and English. But six of them are EMI. So it gives you an idea of how the the policies and the politics and the parents. And another interesting thing, people have a different view depending on which role you ask them, which, which role they're in when you ask them. If you ask a parent, do you want your child to learn English from kindergarten? They say, yes, 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 I do. If you ask the same person as a teacher, should this child learn English from kindergarten? No, 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 no. That's not good academic practice. It's much better for them to... <laughs> so the same person will have a different view, depending whether they're a teacher or a mum or a father. And it's interesting. I mean, it's just... It's, it's one of the very interesting things about this kind of work is that it's so human, right? I mean, there's, there's somebody writing a document somewhere, but <laughs> down here there are all sorts of people struggling with it, one way or another. Uh, This is a, becoming very serious. Wang Gungwu in 2007 said it's becoming increasingly common for people who can afford it to send their children to private schools which teach in English rather than to the local schools that teach in the national language. And that is true. And we're getting to see now Malaysian children, Singaporean children, Filipino children who are coming out of schools really L1 speakers of English are not being so efficient or proficient in their, their national language. Many children in the region are taught in a language that they do not understand now and are thus failing at school. There's a rhetorical promotion of indigenous languages, but actually it's being left mainly to NGOs and religious institutions, with the exception of countries like the Philippines and some exceptions in India, north of India. There's a government-sponsored uh, multi and mother tongue scheme. But one shouldn't underestimate the difficulties in teaching, though, through an indigenous language. Uh, there's a language up in the northern Philippines called Lubuguan, and they developed a scheme for the teaching of through that for the kids in that area which ended up being very successful and the children who were taught through their L1 ended up doing better not only in their first language but also in the other subjects including Filipino uh, in the exams. So it did show that if you learn through your L1 you actually get better results in the longer term. But that project took something like six years to set up and required working very closely with the community so you have community buy-in. The parents have got to buy. The parents have got to think, yes, we want our children to learn this language in the school. If the parents don't want to, then it's going to be really difficult. So it's it's very tough. So it sounds easy to be critical, but the actual issues involved in doing it are very difficult. So the Philippines government, even though they've met lots and lots of difficulties, at least are having a go, and I think it's pretty noble. And that's where all this, if you want to read about it, be all in there. And I have to thank, he, he likes to call himself AJ, uh, and is in his, Tony, <laughs> otherwise known as Tony Lidicott, who is a great friend of mine, and we've been collaborating on this handbook. So if I stop talking there now, this will give you time to answer lots of questions, because there's tons of stuff here. 
And I've also got these glasses somehow tangled around. Well, first of all, let's thank you. Uh, not a can of worms, but certainly a massive um, treasure um, in terms of trying to question and what's actually happening in, um, in, well, in, in Asia. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'd like to ask if any of you have any questions or comments about particular areas or lack thereof or whatever. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so you touched briefly on Central Asia. Um, yeah. About four or five days ago, I spent a short period in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and you still very much get the impression that the Russian still has like a very strong... Right, yeah. But, you know, I speak to people Did like, you say Kyrgyzstan? Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, Turkestan. Yeah. 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 And you still, you know, I spoke to people my age, and they still said, no, 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 we need Russian, because if we want to do what you need, yeah. we need Russian, you know, if we want to leave the country, we're also going to go to Moscow, St. Petersburg. Right. Get a job there. Yeah. What do you think it will take? Because obviously Russia still exerts a very strong political influence, especially on the countries that's not. Yeah. Because you can't do well as What do you think, you know, in your opinion, it would take for English to turn the balance? Well, the person you should ask that question to is Tony, because he's, he's the. But in, in some of these places, English already has moved in. The places that it hasn't, I guess, have still maintained pretty close relations with, this, with Russia. And where, where there is trade, where there, where, <laughs> where there is significant trade, I think then the language will stay strong. People will learn these languages for economic benefit, primarily. Not necessarily for cultural exchange or so much, for economic benefit. One of the, in China, for example, the languages other than Chinese that are, are being learnt successfully are Korean and Mongolian. And that's because they're, they're, they're border languages on the Korean border, Mongolian border, and people make money. They can make a very good living out of it. So there is a, you know, there's an economic imperative for learning those languages, Korean and Mongolian. So I suspect that's what's happening. And that if the economic imperative is there, then people will learn it. Yeah. Uh, and the policy makers can't really do much about that. Yeah. 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 Chapters on each. <laughs> so. Well, if it's published, in, is it published fairly soon? We don't know. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm doing e the final proofs at the moment. Oh, okay. Because the e book usually comes out quite quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it should I'm be. I'm sure that the come. library can order one. From the <laughs> yeah. So it should be. Out. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Could I perhaps ask? Yeah. I mean, given what you've said about, oh well, you should ask Tony. So. Um, You've both taken particular parts of Asia um, and take responsibility for looking after that. Why I'm asking that is one area, and I'm just looking at uh, Barbara here, is clearly a very interesting area <laughs> because it is so different. It's actually Japan. Now, yeah. I assume that Tony is. Tony, Tony's, Tony's more but than but Japan. Really, right. um, you know, Japan is, um, well, as far as I'm concerned, an extremely interesting situation. Mm -hmm not just with English, but also with other languages. Um, I wonder if you could say a few things about that. Well, what we've, Japan, the, the, well, with, within English at the university, well, you probably know about with English, with yeah. conversa kindergarten classes, there's conversational English, and, and then the global super 30, all that stuff, and uh, trying to get 300,000 international students into the university systems and so forth. Uh, to develop global human resources, various things. So that's the sort of the English part of it. Uh, other languages we think are not really doing very well. Portuguese is because of a lot of migrant population from Brazil and so forth. Uh, so there are pockets of Portuguese, but as far as, well, again, Tony's the guy to ask, but as far as I understand, these are, tend to be sponsored by community groups rather than necessarily than the government. Uh, Korean, yeah. But no, not 
I mean, Japan's, I have to be careful what I say here, but Japan's view of internationalization is that people should understand Japan. <laughs> I think. <Absolutely. laughs> That's why I think it's very interesting. Yeah. So. It's, it's a very interesting case study, but I don't want to put you in a situation. I understand it uh, because, you know, yeah. Tony looks after Japan. Yeah. And yes, I'm sorry. Please, uh, Barbara. Yeah. And I just will comment about Japan by saying that it doesn't really have a good record with regards to indigenous languages. No. Well, if it, well the, the place I work in most is, is within ASEAN. And I find that very interesting because they've promoted English as the sole working language. And now, as the language to develop the unity and diversity in ASEAN. And I think that's a really problematic issue because ASEAN school kids do not learn about other ASEAN countries in the school curriculum because they don't learn the languages of the other countries very much. Uh, so it's almost that the English curriculum in the schools has to kind of take on, well, my, well, my advice, was what are sort of the suggestions, would be the English curriculum therefore has to become a curriculum that introduces the kids to the cultures of their neighbors, including the religions, because you've got the four great major religions in the region, you've got, you know, Thai Buddhists talking to Indonesian Muslims. I mean, they need to know what makes each other tick. And the English curriculum is one, is rather maybe paradoxically, uh, the curriculum that might be able to be most effective at doing that. But of course that requires getting a huge sea change in ministry minds that English is an Asian language not a native speaker language spoken by Brits and Americans and Australians. And that's quite a difficult, that's a difficult one. Because they then say, well, you're selling us a second class product. You know, we're not giving you native speaker English, you're selling us something that isn't quite, well, we try to say, no, no, it's not that. It's, you know, English is an Asian language, it's used all the, and we have um, Asian corpus of English, which we collected of, Filipinos talking to Vietnamese, talking to Thais and so forth in English and saying you could use this as a kind of source material for how to develop in the... Because if you look at the kind of things they talk about when they're speaking in English, this was all done naturally occurring uh, data which we collected of multilingual Asians speaking to each other in English as a lingua franca basically. They talk about things not surprisingly that are central to their lives like um, the Thai-Burma border conflicts, like uh, how does one do business with Islamic banks in Malaysia if you're a Korean trader, uh, that kind of thing. But I have never seen any of these topics in an English language textbook in the region. So we're saying, why don't you try and... And they've started a thing called the ASEAN Source Curriculum, which is starting to do that. So in a very small way, it may be that English can introduce people of ASEAN to the cultures of their neighbours. Uh, in a way, I, I could see that, that it might be more neutral than other Asian languages. Yeah. And actually, what I found really interesting was the like, example you gave of the English for Muslim purposes. Islamic purposes, Islamic purposes. yeah. 
I thought it, it's, it's brilliant because it completely divorces the, the, yeah. the, the yeah. cultural background yeah. uh, from the language, yeah. if that is possible. Well, well, well it's, it's, allowing an, it's allowing the language to be reshaped by its new users, and that's what we're saying. You know, the, this language doesn't come with cultural baggage. You can take it and put your own cultural baggage, shape it with your own cultural baggage. And that's what is happening, of course, in Asia. But it's a, a, some people get it, but ministries are still like the book textbook to have OUP or something on it rather than, do you know what I mean? So, but what surprisingly, well, maybe that's unfair, but because the British Council has actually been in many ways at the forefront now of promoting multilingual education. And I've heard senior members of the council arguing for mother tongue education in primary schools, not pushing, you must have English, which is encouraging. Now, the other thing is that there is a belief out there that the earlier you start learning a language, the better. And it's almost impossible to dislodge this, to say that adults are actually quite good at learning languages and delaying language learning doesn't mean you're never going to learn. Trying to get across to people that someone at the age of 12 who comes into a language for the first time can learn it perfectly adequately and doesn't have to start at four or five uh, and leave the primary schools for local and national languages and maybe delay English because you're not going to, you know, you can't not have English because you'd, if you were a politician and said we're not going to teach English, you'd last two seconds. You know, you'd, your, your career would be over before you start. So how can you have your cake and eat it? Well, I think you can have your cake and eat it if you allow local languages and national language at more of the primary level and only introduce English later once the children have literacy and fluency in their L1 and maybe the national language. That I think works. But then you come back to Indonesia and you say, well, okay, that sounds very good, but there are 700 languages here. Which ones of these are we going to have for languages of education? Of course, that's, you know, the, the first answer to that is, does it have an orthography? You know, if not, you have to develop the orthography. And that's what the Philippines did with Tagalog. I mean, the, the National Language Commission basically created the national language from uh, Filipino, from Tagalog. And that's what happened in Indonesia. The sort of language commissions are developing standardized forms uh, of the language. But it's a very, very hard sell. Uh, it's a very hard sell. And I. If you ask me what I think the likelihood of the three or four thousand languages that are in Asia spoken being around in 50 years time, I'd say I'd be pretty pessimistic about uh, a lot of them actually. Well, I think so, I sort of know <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm sure that. Yeah. Yeah. Any more comments? When you say 700 languages in Indonesia, does this include the languages of Irian Jawa? Hmm. It includes Irian Jawa, yeah. But not Papua. No, not Papua. No, but, but Irian, yeah. This is connected with the question where does Asia end? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah. And where Indonesia ends? Or does it end before Indonesia ends? It ends where Indonesia ends, I guess, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It does. So once you get to Australia, it's all over. You're out. You're, you're off you know, the We're talking about fluidity and other things. Yeah. So we have to be yeah. fluid <laughs> ge geopolitical borders as well. Well, yeah. I mean... Any it, other comments or questions? But I mean, that, the, the point about Indonesia, though, is fascinating because it is such a diverse yeah. country and itself. Uh, it's just... It's so does the same uh, policy apply in Indonesia and Java? Well... You know what the Chinese say, when, when the emperor is far away. <laughs> so the emperor's in Beijing, we can do what we want. Um, so what happens in Aceh compared with what happens in Irian Jaya compared with what happens in Malacca? Well, that's tough. I was in Malacca a couple of years ago, and uh, they're still teaching Batak in some schools there, for example. So 
but not in a kind of uh, systematic way. Hmm. There's a book coming out this in a few months, written by myself and a guy called Wang Li Shun, on trilingual education in Hong Kong. So, it's all, it's in, but that's just, I mean, there's a big debate in Hong Kong at the moment whether Pudonghua should be taught to teach people how to write or Cantonese, which should be the medium of instruction for the Chinese subject. The pressure from the mainland, of course, is obvious that it wants Pudonghua, and the pressure from Hong Kong is the opposite, of course, because Cantonese is the language of identity and I'm a Hong Konger. And so there's a huge, it, it's a huge issue in Hong Kong, but it's, it's a political one and an identity one and umbrella movement one and all sorts of things like that. I mean, they're all linked into that, so, uh, but I hope Hong Kong will stay firm and retain Cantonese as the MOI uh, because it's about the only place left where Cantonese is taught in, in, as a language of education in that way. There are, as you know, I mean, there are lots of people now in Guangzhou itself asking for more Cantonese and saying, why do we have to listen to broadcasts in Pudonghua? Why can't we have Cantonese on the radio and stuff? So there's an there's a upswell of discontent, I think, about the, the language policy and wanting. Or s similarly with uh, Minanhua on the, in Fujian and places like that. Because you make lots of money if you speak Minanhua. The Taiwanese go, good, good, good. It's very small. I mean, the numbers of people learning Portuguese is... T one, one of the things that, a cynical view, <laughs> is that uh, if the government r insists on Portuguese for civil servants, of course it guarantees jobs for people who speak Portuguese. Okay, so I mean, that's uh, one way of looking at it. But the number of people actually learning Portuguese. I mean, again, there's a Brazilian influence. And if you go to the University of Macau, the Portuguese department there is, uh, I mean, most of the students in the Portuguese department at the University of Macau are from Lusophone Africa, Cape Verde or places like this, they're going there, and some from Brazil. Uh, so it's not Portugal again, it's, it tends to be Lusophone countries. So, that, and they also, I don't know how, what happened here, but there was some talk about Macau working with uh, Timor-Leste uh, to try and work with Portuguese there because of the links and Macau having more money than Timor-Leste at the time. I'm not sure what happened, whether they, they set up a kind of a sp special arrangement with the universities or not, I'm not sure, but they were talking about it. Yeah, that's an interesting. I think we'll leave it at that. Um, okay. I'd like you to um, join me. Thank you. Andy, thank you so much. I mean, you've thank done you. a lot of things here. A, you have promoted your book. But <laughs> what I think is very good is that we have, in fact, received a sort of preview of the sorts of different elements about language and education policy. You've certainly explained a lot, but you've also raised a whole range of questions. Uh, issues around, for example, you know, why is the spread of English happening the way it is? And in some ways, I think what some of you pointed out, and you too, is that 
many other nations or governments see it purely as a tool. Yeah. So, you know, it becomes a tool rather than actually an element of identity. I don't think it's true, but that gives them this neutrality. Um, yeah. Secondly, you certainly pointed out the challenges for, uh, let's say, the many, many languages in many uh, countries. How do they enter a mother tongue education? Uh, yeah, the sure. note that I wrote on my piece of paper is resources. resources. The issue is really, um, even if you want to do it, if you've got 700 languages, you have to make a selection. Resources and commitment. Resources and commitment. I mean, I think commitment is very important, but resources, because what you have is, and you need to have textbooks, these yeah. are people who can teach it. Yeah. And uh, even in, uh, let's say, so-called westernized countries, you find that schools, I remember, I mean, we both shared that in Australia, we, uh, when Japanese became very, very popular, you know, uh, private schools in Australia would say, we're not teaching French anymore, we're going to do bilingual Japanese English education. Fantastic, but they didn't have any teachers. Yes, they did have materials. So I think you've also raised that very uh, nicely. And um, thank you to the audience too. You've yes, thank you. asked some quite yeah. challenging questions. Obviously some areas are covered better than others, but um, we're looking forward to using this <laughs> Okay. And since we have a course on language planning and language policy, um, I think that's certainly a talk that we should include in the future. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.